Good evening. It's good to see everybody here, and I know you're enjoying being here. It sounds like you're really enjoying it. And we are glad that you are enjoying it. We'll begin our worship tonight with singing number 642, 642. Let the Lord lights be burning. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from the lighthouse evermore. But to us He gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a beam across the way. Six hundred twenty seven, six twenty seven. After we sing this song, we'll have our scripture reading and prayer. There's a royal banner. There's a royal banner in for display to the soldiers of the king. We lift it up today while this ransom ones we sing. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but lost. For the King of Kings will oil and sing neath the banner of the cross over land and sea. Wherever man may dwell, make the glorious tidings known. Of the crimson banner, now the story tell, while the Lord shall claim his own. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but lost, for the King. Sounds the resurrection day. Then before our King, the faint and foe shall die, and the saints shall march away. Marching on, marching on, for Christ count everything but lost. For the King of kings, for
read tonight from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serving the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's all pray together. Father in heaven, we approach your throne at this time, and we're so thankful, Father, for this opportunity we have to worship you, to come together as brothers and sisters of like precious faith, to sing these songs of praise and to hear a portion of your word. We're thankful, Father, that we have this avenue of prayer, and we pray, Father, as you look down upon us, that you'll forgive us of our sin, that as we talk to you, we can stand pure and clean in your sight. We're so thankful, Father, that we have this uh, blessing that we can have forgiveness of sin when we do say those things and do those things that are contrary to your will. We're thankful, Father, for the reading for Perry, and we thank you for all of our elders here and their families that work with us and support us and support these elders as they do their work. We're thankful, Father, that we can hear your word read and we have it, that we can read it for ourselves and to know what we should be doing. We're thankful that we have these examples as Perry read to us, and we pray, Father, we'll be like those that uh, not only will we spread the word in our community, but spread it throughout the world. We thank you, Father, for men like Barton and, and uh, men like Andy who stand in pulpits and do the work to spread the gospel in various forms uh, through various ways, whether it's uh, through their voice or through their writings. Uh, we're so thankful that we have men like this in our brotherhood that uh, proclaim your word in various ways. Thank you, Father, for their families that support them uh, to allow them to be able to use their life in service to you. We pray, Father, that you'll be with Barton tonight as he brings the message, and we're so thankful for his work, and we pray, Father, you'll bless his work, uh, and pray, Father, that many lost souls will come to know you because of his efforts. We ask you, Father, to continue to be with us through this service as we sing more songs and we hear your word being taught that we'll put these things in our heart that will not only bless us, but we use it to bless others and have our light to shine in this community. We ask you, Father, to be with those that we know of that are sick and those who are recovering from various surgeries and uh, various illnesses. We just pray, Father, your blessing upon them even this hour that they can be comforted and that their road to recovery will be short. We ask all these blessings and favors in Jesus' name. Amen. At the conclusion of our lesson tonight, we'll sing number 736, number 736. We're happy to have with us tonight, as Mark mentioned in the prayer, Barton and Allison Kaiser and the kids. Uh, Barton is our youngest son, for those of you who do, don't know, and presently he is um, doing double duty in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, where he's uh, still preaching for the Latino church there in that area on the, on the Lord's Day and working with them through the week. But he is presently director of the uh, special projects of Great Cities Missions 
And so they're in the process of getting ready to move to Dallas in June, uh, where his office is. Right now he's still working from home. They're letting him do that until the school year ends, and uh, they're able to make that move to Dallas. And he'll be telling us about that and the work. And uh, so we're glad he's here tonight. Before we hear that, before we hear from him, let's sing number 639, Rescue the Perishing, 639. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We, or the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are sliding him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they truly believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it, strength for the labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them, tell the poor wonder a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Good evening. It's good to be with Salem. We rolled right in here at 4.30 from Huntsville, and I was wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and uh, I knew I couldn't preach in a t-shirt and jeans, especially with mom and dad here. Wouldn't do it anyway, but, but it is uh, good to be with you all, and as dad mentioned earlier, the kids are here uh, with Allison, uh, and... Uh, we're all here together, and we're going to spend a couple of days with mom and dad, and wanted to be able to be with the Salem congregation too. So uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, here with you this evening. Dad mentioned a few things about our plans, and we are uh, bouncing around in a lot of different places these days. Um, we are busy making plans, and once we uh, spend um, a week here in Alabama, we're going to go back to North Carolina continue ministry there, continue working, as Dad mentioned, in, in the two works. Uh, but we'll also, on the side, in the evenings when we can, carve out time to pack. We get to pack. And everybody loves to pack. And so we, we get the blessing of packing. So we're going to start taking things off walls and putting them in boxes and uh, wrapping things up. And uh, we're excited about the new work that... I've, I've been involved with, with Great Cities Missions. Um, it's interesting that uh, in the world of mi missions and the work of missions these days, I believe that we need to be recruiting more, training more, and caring for more missionaries. Uh, recruiting more because during COVID and after COVID, so many missionaries came home. I know in the country of Peru, where we served for several years, uh, most of the missionaries came home during COVID. We had a second wave that was there in Cusco, and all of them returned home during COVID, and they did not go back. Uh, and I can name one or two missionaries in Peru that I know, whereas before there were many others. I think it's not just Peru, but all over. So what are we doing to recruit missionaries, to go to our Christian colleges, to go to Bible institutes, to go to different places 
and recruit teams to be able to put them together, form them, and then train them so that when they go on the field, they know what to do. It's not just they walk into a city, but they have a plan. They're intentional. They have a strategy. And so uh, that's another area we need to be working on. And then finally, we realized while we were in Peru that the longest, at, or excuse me, the average tenure of a missionary was about a year and a half anywhere in the mission field. And so we need to be working more to try to have more permanence and a permanent presence among missionaries so that the work can be done, so that stable and eventually uh, autonomous, self-sufficient churches can be established in different areas of the world, so that missionaries can work themselves out of a job. And so all of that encompasses the work at Great Cities, the, where I'm working currently. And we, we don't send missionaries. We work with partnering churches, congregations, the local church, and they send the missionaries. But we do a lot of recruiting. We do the training. And we also visit and do team care. So I've already been involved in some of that, even remotely, and uh, got a trip coming up soon to El Salvador. And so we'll be working remotely, but also uh, being able to, to make site visits and recruiting in different areas that we can, and, and uh, a lot of great work that can be done. It's been going on for over 40 years with this organization, and I know that there's so much more that we can do. Meanwhile, in Charlotte, we're working on an exit strategy, and there's been some baptisms and some good work in, in the, the recent years, but there's also some major obstacles there with the work. However, uh, two young men, one from El Salvador and one from Honduras, have been raised up recently, and I've been working with them and the man from Honduras preached in my place uh, this morning, and the elders have met with him where I serve, and they have invited him to work um, in a full-time role whenever we transition out. So there's already someone in place to continue the work there in Charlotte. The other man I work with is now studying at a Bible institute virtually, so he can continue to work in Charlotte, and he's plugged in in another local congregation there uh, to be able to develop a new work with the Hispanic ministry there. And so there have been obstacles in Charlotte for us. However, there have been blessings too. And we're excited to see what's in store for the work there in Charlotte. I don't have a presentation this, this uh, evening. I'm going to preach this evening. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, we'll look at verses 3 through 10. We'll look at God's mysterious plan revealed. We'll look at what Paul wrote uh, about God's plan in his first chapter to the Ephesians. As you're looking for that and thinking about that, I want to uh, put something out there that maybe you can relate to, and that is, from time to time, we have the burning question, how is it all going to end? I know I thought a lot about that in Peru. Uh, I thought, how is it going to end? How is it that this is all going to come together where missionaries can leave and where evangelists will be in place and that there'll actually be a local church meeting here in Cusco? I thought about it in other ways too. This question, how is it all going to end? Um, I think it's one that raises itself on a pretty frequent basis in our lives. Uh, the pandemic we went through in 2020, 2021, 2022, and we're still asking that question a lot of times. How's this going to end? In, in some, some ways, it's still going on, the, the effects, the consequences of the pandemic, however, uh, whatever aspects of it you want to look at. Um, on a small individual basis in our lives, we often ask that question, how's this going to end? Maybe it's something we're going through. Maybe it's a, a struggle we've had. Maybe it's a job opportunity. Maybe it's, uh, if you're like me and you're raising young kids and you're looking at your, your, your sons and daughters and you're thinking, how's that going to end? What are they going to grow up to be? You know, we're doing the best we can. We're praying for them. We're teaching them the Bible at home. We're bringing them to church. How's it going to end? So this is a constant question in our lives. And I think in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes... Inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he writes scripture centered around what was that question for centuries for God's people. 
How is this going to end? Where is this all going? And we know in this passage, the answer is Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 through 13 in the Greek is all one long sentence. Maybe you've heard about Paul and his reputation in the Greek for having just one long sentence without what we would see as uh, commas and periods in English. This is one of those passages. And when you read it, you realize that it's written that way because he uh, is just giving us a long list of what he calls blessings, spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. And so let's look at Ephesians 1. We'll pick up in verse 3, and Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he gives us four spiritual blessings that we'll read in verses 3 through 10. We could continue in verses uh, 11 through 13 and read about the Holy Spirit as well. We should mention that. Uh, we don't have time to develop that in the sermon this evening, but we, can't, we should add the Holy Spirit to that list. But let's look at the four that he mentions here. Look at verse, verses 4 and 5. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. We see here in the first place election and adoption. Or predestination and adoption. Predestination, uh, many teach that it's on an individual basis. We know that it's on a corporate basis. That Paul is talking about a group, God's people, those who have heard and obeyed the gospel, being predestined, being elected, being called sons and daughters of God. And we see, see the idea of adoption there, adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. And so... We, through hearing the gospel and putting Christ on in baptism, we become adopted sons and daughters of God. That's the first spiritual blessing. Number two, look at verse 6. To the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. The Beloved, some translations just say the loved one. We know that that's Jesus. He has given us grace through the work and has blessed us through His Son, Jesus. I was looking at notes for this lesson and I ran across this definition by author Snodgrass in his commentary on Ephesians. He says, grace is God's unbelievable acceptance of us. I've never heard it put that way. I've heard it in, a, in a, another way, a familiar one that's, uh, that we hear a lot. But this author says, it's God's unbelievable acceptance of us. That's what grace is. Because if you put everything on paper, and you can read it on paper in the book of Romans, you can read it in other scripture too, that it shouldn't have ended this way, but because of God's goodness and His grace, He has accepted us. He has allowed us to be called sons and daughters. And then grace is seen in every aspect of living. It's not just salvation. Well, we know that grace is given to us in many aspects of life. Second Corinthians, Paul talks about giving as a grace. So grace defines the Christian life. Number three, he mentions redemption and forgiveness. Let's continue in verses 7 and 8. In Jesus, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. Riches, Paul says, that He lavished upon us in all wisdom an insight. This is the idea of redemption and forgiveness. Redemption in the ancient world was used in covenant language. It was used in the marketplace. And maybe you've heard before that that word was, was used when loved ones would go to the marketplace and they would purchase, they would redeem someone from slavery. That was redemption. And it's useful for us today as we talk about God's Grace being lavished on us because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He paid the price. We were slaves to sin. And it was an ultimate price. It was death on the cross. It was uh, denying himself of his divine essence so that he could walk as man and, and live among us and eventually 
die on the cross. And doing so, he redeemed us from slavery. He, he bought us back, and in that we see forgiveness. And finally, the last that we'll look at, the last spiritual blessing on the list that's found in Christ is in verses 9 and 10. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is what I want to look at. I want to look at uh, Revelation and the gospel for the rest of our time this evening. Paul says that there was a mystery reveal that was a spiritual blessing found in Jesus. This grace that was lavished upon us, this redemption and forgiveness that we have in Christ, this was all revealed in the fullness of time. When Jesus came, lived among us, died on the cross, and rose from the grave. And Paul says that it's a mystery. Today, uh, we have a genre that's mystery. And so we read novels, or we watch movies, or, uh, or we, we think about something mysterious, and it's exciting and adventurous to us, it's suspenseful. But the word was used differently during that time. It, Paul is referencing something that's already revealed. It's no longer a mystery to us. It's something that can be known today. And when we consider God's will and the revelation of his will to us in the form of Jesus Christ and the spiritual blessing of it, we usually have two reactions to God's will. First of all, a lot of times, God's will revealed in our lives something that we can only discern in hindsight a lot of times as we look back. It disappoints us, doesn't it? A lot of times when we're going through whatever it is and, and we finally see how it all is going to end, we're disappointed. Why is that? In our human weakness, we form the plan in our own mind. We consider and we create in our minds how it all is going to end. But a lot of times God has a different plan for us. And on the onset, it's disappointing. It's upsetting to us. We didn't want it to work out this way. But how many times have we said towards the end of it, well, I'm glad it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out. God had a different plan. What is that? This is the second reaction a lot of times we have. As time goes on, we look back and, and really we're surprised with joy, aren't we? we? We look back at God's will and we say, God is good. God was looking out for me. God was protecting me. God was with me. God's will is good. His plan is mysterious. It's not always revealed to us. But in hindsight, we see His goodness. For example, let's look at God's revealed will in the gospel story. I like looking through Scripture and seeing the reaction and the anticipation of the prophets, of the apostles, of the righteous people, as we'll see, of even the angels longing to see the revealed will of God. There was great anticipation. Let's look at a, a couple of passages that illustrate this. For example, look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul says, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul says that it was his ministry to bring to light the mystery revealed of God. This was in the same passage, of course, as what we read earlier. Look at another example in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 12. Uh, Peter writes, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was not revealed to them that they were serving, uh, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves. He sa Peter says the prophets were not serving themselves when they were searching and inquiring carefully. They were serving who? You. Those in the Christian age, those after Christ's coming, those prophets were serving us. 
And he says, "...in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven." He adds this, things into which angels long to look. That's powerful when we think about what the Bible is, the message of Christ, what we have in our hands, what we have on our cell phones, what we keep on our nightstand next to our bed, what we let collect a little dust from time to time. Angels long to look. Prophets searched and inquired carefully. I imagine for centuries righteous people look back and wonder how's it all going to end? We know. We're spiritually blessed in Christ and we know the story. Look for one more example in Matthew 13. Jesus is talking about the parables and he says in verses 16 and 17, but blessed are your eyes For they see, and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and hear what you hear and did not hear it. And we get it today. We have it right here in front of us. What many suffered and died for, what they prophesied about, what they anticipated, what they later translated into our own languages, the great cost and expense and sacrifice was all made. Revealed to us such an easy way you can buy it at books a million for just a few dollars. And so we wonder how it is all going to end in many aspects of our life. And then we look at the gospel story and we, we consider its greatness, we consider its impact on our lives, and we, we ask the question could a human mind, could it? invent such a story in such a way? I don't think so. Had he been planning this all along, we know that he did before the foundation of the world. It was an eternal purpose and plan. And considering the gospel story this evening, we know that the world had those two reactions. On the one hand, they were initially upset. God in the flesh, born in Bethlehem in such a humble way. Born the son of a carpenter, not a king, not a prince, not a scholar, not a rabbi. The son of a carpenter. Where was he raised? In Galilee, in Nazareth, in a small town, despised by some, we know. And then, what did he aspire to be? He aspired to be killed. In a sense, that was his mission, a sacrifice. In fact, he predicted it. And how upsetting that was and frustrating and disappointing it was for the apostles, his disciples who were listening to him. God's will revealed to the first century people following Jesus was very upsetting. That final night, crucified on the cross. It was manifested, their their disappointment was manifested in the fact that he died alone, abandoned. However, what initially is disappointing eventually surprises us with great joy. The third day he was raised from the dead. There was a resurrection. There was an empty tomb. He walked once again. He, He was risen from the grave to never die again. He blessed us with His presence again. He ascended into the heavens. And then what happened? The Holy Spirit came. Among the apostles, the day of Pentecost happened. The church began to move. There were 3,000, then 5,000, then then it was not able to be contained. Started in Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and the other most parts of the earth. And it's shocking. Do you think the people of the first century would be shocked to know that the gospel is being preached in Florence, Alabama in the year 2023? I think so. But that's how God's will is. It's upsetting, but then it's surprising with a great joy. God's will is full of goodness and love, but it's not revealed in the way we would like it to be revealed many times. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 15, the prophet writes, truly you are a God who hides himself. 
And I agree with Isaiah. I think that's inspiration speaking through the prophet saying that, yes, God is mysterious. He is a God who hides himself. And just as redemption points to a present and the future, the revelation of God's will points to both present and future. And a lot of times we say it like this, the Christian life is a blend of the now and the not yet. And so we live in the now, but we hope for, we long for a not yet. We uh, experience God's revealed will now, but we know that there also awaits a day when we will know him face to face in the not yet. And we long for that day. Now we, we are in the place of the prophets and the angels who are longing for another great day when his will will be revealed once again. And, and consequently, because of that, in our times of weakness, we sometimes assume that God is not working. Or maybe he's not working in our lives, maybe he's working in someone else's life as we compare ourselves to others. And that's frustrating for us. But we forget in those times of weakness, once again, that God is a good God. And perhaps a hidden God is a good God. Perhaps a mysterious God who hasn't revealed himself in a full, the fullest way is a good God to serve. Why is that? Because, and this is the point I want to end on this evening, because he teaches us to wait. You can't wait if all is revealed. And not only that, but we'll look at Scripture in just a moment for some examples in this, but when we're waiting, God is actually doing something to us. A lot of times we address or we approach the Christian life and we feel like that we will be blessed at the end, but right now there's nothing for us. There's just this old world that, that we're going to walk through and eventually we'll get through it all and then we'll be blessed. But Scripture teaches us in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 through 10, we see those four or five things in the way God blesses us in Christ, spiritual blessings, that there are rich blessings in the waiting God blesses us in a tremendous way. I'll give you a few examples. First of all, we know in the book of Isaiah that uh, the first part of the book, Isaiah the prophet is giving a series of warnings, prophecies against God's people. They have given themselves to idolatry. They have not helped the, the neighbor. They have not been gracious and giving to, to uh, other people in their nation, and therefore, condemnation is coming. Because they turned their back on God, because they were unfaithful, judgment is coming. That's the first part. The second part, beginning in chapter 40, Isaiah begins to talk about comfort. Isaiah's second message is, but comfort will come. There will be an exile, but there'll be a return from exile. There'll be the ability to receive God's blessings once again. And this is what he says in a familiar passage in Isaiah chapter 40. He talks about how God is inexhaustible. How God never faints. He never loses strength in Isaiah 40 verses 29 and 30. Look at Isaiah 40 verse 31. But they who wait, maybe the word in another translation is hope. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah says to the people, God's people, yes, there will be judgment, but during the judgment, during the exile, what do we need to be doing? Wait. What happens while we wait? It's not just waiting and nothing else. There's actually something happening to us. God renews our strength. God helps us to run. God helps us to walk and not faint. God is with us in the waiting. The spiritual blessings are not just in the not yet, but also in the now. There is something that happens. Let me give you two illustrations. The first one is in James 1, verses 2 through 4. James is talking about trials. The difficult parts of our life. In a minute, he'll talk about temptations. But he's talking about the trials and difficulties in our life. And 
to his listeners, he says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Applying it to what we're talking about right now, he's saying that while you're in the trial, while you're going through that, and you're asking the question, how is this all going to end? Where's this all going? Why am I going through this? James says, don't forget that God is actually doing something in you during that trial. It's producing what? Steadfastness. And steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What a great blessing. Maturity, suffering, trials, the waiting, the difficulty, that season of life is actually producing steadfastness, which brings you to completion, brings you to maturity. Something happens to us while we face trials. The second illustration is uh, from a movie I don't know very well. I mentioned this earlier, too, that uh, Wizard of Oz... It's one of Allison's favorite movies. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details because I'll mess it up and then I'll be corrected. Uh, but I know this. Uh, there's a wizard and they're an Oz. And I know more than that. Also, there's uh, Dorothy who uh, is lost and she finds herself in the land of Oz. And then there's uh, three characters uh, on the yellow brick road. The lion, the tin man, and the scarecrow. And what's... Uh, Essential for the story of the Wizard of Oz is what? Each of these characters are lacking in something. The lion is lacking courage. The tin man is lacking a heart. The scarecrow is lacking a brain. And Dorothy at some point meets up with all these three and they're going to go down the journey together. And what's in their hearts, or at least everyone except the tin man, what, what are they thinking about as they're going down the yellow brick road? When we get to the wizard, he's going to solve all of our problems. The solution is getting to the wizard. The Wizard of Oz will help us in, in what's lacking in us. And really, the, the whole essence of the story is in that part. It's not in the conclusion. Because it, during the story, it's a series of obstacles and it's a series of, of just uh, enemies that come in their path and they're having to overcome things. And at the very end, what happens? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain and the Wizard of Oz is actually not who he said he was. And it's this uh, hoax and, and it's just this sham and he's like one of them. He, can't, he doesn't have the power to give them what they need. And he gives them little emblems that represent something that they're wanting and longing for. But what's the moral of the story? They receive the blessings not at the destination, but during the journey. And in fact, Glenda the Good Witch says this to Dorothy. Frank Baum, who wrote the story, uh, recorded, or, or say recorded this, he wrote this for the character. It says, you've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. What's the point of that story? The point is that they who lack courage or lack the heart and lack the brain, they found those on the journey. They were blessed with those during the time of waiting, not just at the end. That's not a complete parallel for the gospel story. We know that there is a uh, unique and powerful blessing for us at the end. A crown of righteousness, Paul writes about. As we finish the race, something in store for us. So there's that. But my point this evening, as we look at Ephesians chapter 1, and we look at the blessings that are found in Christ, that this life matters. That there are great blessings to have in Christ now. That there are spiritual blessings in the waiting. So as we close, and as we consider the gospel invitation this evening... I want you to consider that God doesn't just bless us in the not yet. God blesses us in the now. God doesn't bless us on just the good days. God blesses us on the bad days. He doesn't just bless us when we have good health, but also when we're sick. Not only when we're wealthy, 
but when we're poor. God is such a good God that he finds a way to bless his children in all seasons of life. And as you long for that ultimate revelation, and as you look at that list in Ephesians 1 and want to be in Christ, the final question is this, how do we come to be in Christ? And that's where we mention the gospel invitation one more time. We'll look at Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27. Paul, the same author, writes, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. In Christ Jesus. And Paul doesn't leave us hanging with just that information, but he tells us the rest in verse 27. For as many as you, of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How can I be in Christ? I put on Christ in baptism. And when we're baptized, we belong to a church family. But not only that, we receive so many spiritual blessings in Christ. We want to invite you to be a part of that. If you need to, put on Christ in baptism right now as we stand and as we sing. pray for John Henry, who uh, has been in Pan Panama for more than a week now. We, he's, uh, the plan is for him to come home on Tuesday, so I, and uh, we pray that, that uh, he does get home uh, safely on Tuesday. And pray also for Perry and uh, Jordan Bredrick, who will be leaving Thursday night for Thailand. We hope and pray they have a safe trip. You want to announce about the uh, wedding and the reception? Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. Just a couple of announcements, reminders. Uh, ladies, you're all invited to our Keepers at Home meeting at 6.30 Thursday night. The theme is spring cleaning. Think of three cleaning or household tips to share. Also bring a useful item that you want to get rid of. We're going to play a game with that and have a devotional. This uh, coming Saturday, Lord willing, we'll have a work day. We're going to start at 8, uh, but many of you may not be able to make that, but just come when you can. Uh, hopefully try to uh, get through maybe around 1 or 2. Uh, I know the prime timers have a, an outing that afternoon, and I know you may want to get back for that. But if you can come Saturday, we've got some inside and outside work, depending on the weather. But we'll need several uh, able-bodied men and women to help with that. Also sign the list in the foyer if you're planning to attend Savannah and Michael's wedding. That's coming up in a couple of weeks, so uh, if you plan to attend that, please sign the list. Thank you. I'd like to say just a few words about Lads to Leaders this weekend. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you who have been praying for that, praying for these kids as they um, have been working on things to, um, to be better leaders in the church. That's what it's all about is helping build up 
godly leaders, and we're already seeing that out of our group. Um, I would like to give a little bit of praise to Martha and Nathan, you know, being the older ones of the group, and only being two of them, it would have been easy to just say, you know what, we just won't go, we just won't do it since it's just a couple of us. But they step up, they, they led, um, they were very helpful with puppets, helping Emberly and Kesslin, um, never complained one time about anything, and thankful for, for them, and thankful for our group, hopefully we can grow our group, but very thankful for the group that went, they competed in several things, um, song leading, art, um, puppets, and several other things. I can't name them all off right now, but um, it was a very good weekend, very proud of our group and everything that they did. Before we pray and go home, let's sing one verse of number 652. We've heard the joyful sound. 652. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's okay. Uh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, we want to add to our prayer list then uh, John and Mary Brooke Alexander, who will also be going to Thailand Thursday night with uh, Perry and Jordan. And uh, um, so I'm glad we didn't uh, fail to announce that before we left. So please uh, be praying for them all as well. 652. We have heard the joyful sound Jesus saves, Jesus saves Spread the tides all around Jesus saves, Jesus saves Bear the news to every land Climb the seas and cross the waves Onward tis our Lord's land Jesus saves, Jesus saves in our closing prayer I also failed to mention the Lord's Supper if you were not able to partake of uh, communion today it is prepared for you so you may be dismissed uh, right now and uh, go to the room down the hall to the left it's in the library okay thank you it's in the library on the right we need to get somebody else to do this who can do it right Well, even then, yeah, that's right. I'm out of practice. All right, so glad you're here with us tonight. Be safe going home. Uh, Brother Jim, my hand's going to lead us in a closing prayer. Let us bow as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, the Lord's Day, Father, that we can come and assemble in this auditorium and worship and praise and, and uh, honor you, Father, as our heavenly uh, Father. Father, we thank you for all the blessings we've had. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died upon that cross and was risen from the dead. Without him, we know that we have no hope. Father, we just thank you for all those in the mission fields. We continue to pray for John and Mary Brooke and Perry and Jordan as they prepare to go to Thailand. We pray, Father, that they'll have a safe journey there and a safe journey back home. And the work that they do over there, that there'll be many fruits that come from that. And Father, we also ask you to continue to be with John Henry as he's in Panama, and, and may he have a safe journey at home as well. Father, thank you for Barton and others, so many all over the world, Father, who are missionaries who sacrifice so much to go and spread your gospel. And Father, we just ask you to be with us through the rest of this week. Let us live our lives as though it were our last day on earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.